Hey guys, and welcome back to this episode of La Cancha. And I'm here as you with Oscar. And Oscar, what a game did we just witness? Yeah, it was quite a game. And Valencia absolutely destroying Hetafe by five goals to one. Like breathtaking football by Katusa's side. And Vinicius Musa playing extremely well. Lino playing extremely well. Guillermoan playing extremely well. Everyone was just really on it today. And the Tafi were just like so terrible. But nonetheless, like Katusa Ball has really arrived. Yeah, and, and I'll say watching this, this has been coming because Valencia, they've been very good in all the three games. They, mm-hmm. were, they were very unlucky against Athletic not to get a draw. Against Atletico in the first 60 minutes, Valencia were the better side by far. I also mm-hmm. say in the first game against Girona, although it was just a penalty. But in this game, Samolino was amazing. Musa was amazing. There were so many good individual performances from this mm-hmm. Valencia side. Mm-hmm. As you said, Hetafe played a role in, in this game, given what happened with Soria, who pretty much assisted two goals. Soria has uh, been assisting literally every goal Hetafe have considered this season. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I mentioned this last week or two weeks yeah. ago that I don't know what's wrong with him. <laughs> no. And it also begs the question, and we'll get on to Atleti, in, later in this program, like whether we should put much stock in Atleti's 3 0 victory and match day one. That's the thing. Back then, I saw a lot of people really, really praising Atleti, and I was, I was quite about to, I was kind of like, I should you really be praising them like this because I felt like they didn't play that w- as well as a trainer that day. But then that result is aging a bit badly because of how bad <laughs> that they are. <laughs> like, honestly, yeah, like, yeah. Hetafe, you know me, everyone on Twitter knows I was the biggest hype man for Hetafe because of all the signings they made and they've just slapped me in the face. Yeah, like, like, it's strange to see what's going on at Real Atafi because they finished last year so strongly. Mm-hmm. They were a very disciplined team, hard to beat. They won most of their games at home. And you see them right now, and it's like they're so lackadaisical defensively. They allowed so many opportunities. Yes, the first two goals were really, really good from Valencia, and I think they could score that against anyone. But mm-hmm. Atafi didn't really show up for this game. Valencia were just all over them. Yeah. And they got to a point for Itafe where they just started taking down Valencia players because they were so frustrated. <laughs> they couldn't touch the ball and anything. And yeah. obviously, a Valencia versus Itafe match cannot go by without a red card. So we got we got, <laughs> we got two red cards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah. But you know what makes me happy from Valencia's perspective? Mm-hmm. Is the fact that right now, when you're watching Valencia games, you go into it expecting an, a spectacle. The fans are back, the like ultras are back in the stadium. So it creates a really nice atmosphere. And it, you get a feeling like you're watching a big club, unlike a couple of seasons ago where it was very drab. There was not mm-hmm. much atmosphere. There was mm-hmm. divorce between the fans and the team. And now you can see the fans are fully behind this team. And talking to some other Valencia fans, they seem pretty excited about this team. And where do you think? they can go like do you feel this is just early days and we should show or do you feel like this is a team given what's happening to Sevilla can maybe fight for top seven for top seven while there are a couple of stronger teams on paper you have to acknowledge that this team is a very young team and young teams have unknown potential and that potential can be very very high that yeah. said, if they play to their potential and they keep, and we keep seeing the process we've seen, because like you said, the first three games for Valencia, they haven't played a bad game. This season. there was there was a lot of good things to be enjoyed. If they can keep yeah. doing this, then I think top seven is a possibility. When you now throw in the World Cup and everything, and the fact that they only play one game a week, so it's, Valencia fans are right to be excited. Yeah, and then you have to factor in the fact that Gaia didn't play in this game. Cavani yeah, so. didn't play in this game. Mm-hmm. Paulista didn't play in this game. So, yeah, so. there's this team a lot to get better. Yeah. 
Yeah, imagine yeah, if let's Cavani. See what team that would. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say if, if Cavani, Cavani if Cavani is like if like stays fit and is really informed, then the potential for this team skyrockets. Yeah, it, it really does. Um, and I'm excited to see what happens when he finally comes in. Mm-hmm. But the team like Sevilla really need a song like Cavani on Saturday. Then they uh, they mm-hmm. came to the game against Barcelona. They started very well. I, in the first 20 minutes, I thought maybe, okay, they'll turn the corner. But after that, they just collapsed and Barcelona just took the game away from them. Yeah, like... You said they need Cavani. I feel after that game, they need more than Cavani. They need, they need everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. There's why I say that, right? It's because like there are two moments in that game mm-hmm. that I feel maybe could have changed. I'm not sure. Maybe Barcelona still won five two or one four, but mm-hmm. in the first twenty minutes, and a Syria has this chance, where it's one on one with again. If he scores that, I think that changes the the like trajectory of this game. Mm-hmm. Lamela has a chance early in the second half that can make it 2 1. Right. Rakitic point, had that chance in the first, first half. Too. Yeah. 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 So I, mean, I don't know what to say. Yes, it's in. I liked what I saw from Sevilla in terms of the approach, the new formation, just that the personnel was not good. If he, for example, if you switched out, Isco for Papu, who was very sharp when he came on Oliver. You put Delaney instead of maybe Goodell or anyone instead of Goodell. The yeah. center backs, you can't really do much about that. But if you make, just make those changes that I made, that maybe Adra from me, that's a pretty good team that can play like a little more aggressive than they usually do. So there's yeah. some there's some optimism, but then the way the final 70 minutes of the game went for them. That optimism is kind of like, yeah, let's forget about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because um, this might seem like an exaggeration, but Barca could have had seven, given the way they counterattack. Yeah, of course. Given the situations, it was like a lot of four and twos in defense. And what you remember from Sevilla of last season is that they were, yes, they were dry going forward, but defensively, they were very solid, they were very organized. And if you take a look at, let's say, the third goal by Barcelona, where it's a five on two in defending the cross from the corner. Mm-hmm. And Barca have five players there, and like Sevilla's players, like they're so badly positioned. And I, I don't know what's going to happen against Manchester City because I feel they'll be much more ruthless than Barcelona. Yeah, that's the thing. Because what prevented us from scoring more than three was the fact that some of our players decided to be a bit stingy. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> wanted to get in on the act. But yeah, I, I remember I said that Sevilla could easily concede 10 between these two games. Trade down. <laughs> if Man City are in that mood that they can be in, I don't need to say anything. Let's just keep going. <laughs> Yes. So, like, just before it gets to Barcelona, who's to blame for the Sevilla situation? Is it Lopetegui? Is it the personnel? Is it Monchi? I, I blame Monchi a lot rules? more than anybody else because I remember I always, from my perspective, I always saw, felt Sevilla would lose Kunde this summer. So I was like, okay, you guys are going to get maybe what at least sixty million for him. Then I found out that they were losing cargos early in the summer. I'm like, okay, wow. If you people are going to sell Boto, and that means Monchi as usual must have made a checklist of all the good center backs and everything he's going to get, how he's going to revamp the team. That's what I thought. Only for them yeah. to struggle to bring people in. And they even had problems registering people at a point. So I was like, yeah, the poor planning of the way the squad is definitely the bulk of it falls on Monchi. Yes, because yeah, Lopetegui can do some things differently, but against person, I tried something different, but the squad let him down, and that's a monkey for yeah. me. Yeah, and, and I also said, like you said, I feel if was going to play a 4 1 2 1 2, mm-hmm. he should have played NSRI and Mare up mm-hmm. top because yeah. what happens is that NSRI goes to the left. Or if he's playing Mir as a single striker, Mir goes to the left, and there's no center forward making that run mm-hmm. to score the goals. But yeah. let's talk about Barcelona because they were electric. They could have 
they had a fun game in this game. They weren't mm -hmm. really tested apart from the first 20 minutes. Yeah, it was it was it was just weird seeing how comfortable we were after the that rough start. And I saw a lot of discourse on Twitter, like, oh, if we do if we do the first 20 minutes against a big team, we'll get destroyed, this, that. I'm like, guys, calm down. I've noticed something right about Javi's system. Javi is not a possession freak like Pep or a control freak like Pep. And sometimes Javi's our system in away games and some of our players like Gavi actually do quite well in chaotic situations. So I feel like yeah. it's not really a concern. It's not, I'm not, it feels like it's not really concerning if we don't have as much as the ball as we usually do because with the players we have now on the break, we can just, there's more versatility to our game. We can just hit people for fun on the break if we need to. We can keep the ball if we need to. So seeing this versatility, especially in the first half, was really encouraging from the Barca perspective. Yeah, they and that front three of Rafinha, Dembele, Lewandowski, they look so scary. Yeah. And I'll say one thing you could say about Barcelona in the last three seasons before prior to this one, or prior to when Xavi came in, is that they weren't a scary team. They were a good team, but they weren't a mm -hmm. team that really scared you, that you felt, mm -hmm. okay, these guys will score with every opportunity. But now when you look at those three running at you, you're just like, wow, what, what am I going to do? Like, yeah. it's scary for teams in La Liga right now. Yeah, and then when you look at the options of the bench, if like Fatty, for instance, has already changed one game from enough. If Depay and Ferran gets more confident, then it's just better for us. Yeah. And I want to touch on Kunde because he played against the former team. He made two assists. He, he was playing in an unfamiliar right back situation or a familiar right back situation, depending on how you see him. But how do you, do you rate his game? I thought it was really good. It was a you know, it was an improvement on the real value of the game. His pass for Lewandowski was absolutely excellent. Like I, I can't emphasize how much I loved the quality of that pass. And when he came to centre back, even though left sided centre back is kind of unfamiliar for him, he did okay. So a very good outing from Kunde for me. Yeah. Nice. And let's move on to the other half of Seville, which also lost in Mer Mer Madrid versus Betis. And I thought Madrid were excellent in this game. I, the scoreline really flatters Betis for me because they really dominated. Chormini was amazing again. Camavinga yeah. was really well. The Brazilians did really well. And like Barca against Sevilla, I feel Real Madrid really captured the counterattack and they were able to get in behind Betis a lot. Yeah. Real Betis had, like Sevilla, had 20 minutes of fun. But then the fun ended when Real Madrid yeah. really put, started to put their foot on their throat. And I'll say the only team, the only reason why Real Madrid didn't score more is because they, their shooting from distance in this game was quite poor. And that's why they took a lot yeah. of their shots. Otherwise, it was excellent. Um, in terms of defensively, uh, like you said, Tramani had another excellent game. Militao, I thought, was amazing. Like, he did everything right. I mean, you, you, yeah, Iborja was, like, bullying him for the, for the Betis goal, but other than that, I thought he was really good. He covered Carvajal well and everything. And, and Militao is a player who's grown really well, and one thing I really liked about him was, I remember, I think he made his tackle against Kwan Mi, and he celebrated like he scored a goal, and that's mm -hmm. something that we don't really see, let's say, in Spanish football or yeah. associate with Real Madrid, a defender who loves defending. Yeah, and that's it. thing. As a great, as a good, as a defender, you have to love your what you do, obviously. And he did it really well. And yeah, Real Madrid are just inevitable. Like once you know they're going to get the go ahead goal, <laughs> and once they get that yeah. go ahead goal. For me, as a Barca fan watching them, I'm hoping they lose. I just relax because I don't remember the last time Real Madrid have considered a late equalizer or winner. Do you? No, I, I don't. I, I honestly don't. do not. I don't think they, they have before their lives <laughs> at this rate. So, yeah, yeah it's going yeah. to be hard to stop yeah. them. Yeah, it, it really is. Vinny Jr., he scored in this game, and he's really proven this season that last season wasn't a fluke. Yeah, at all. And 
another thing to worry about from a Barca's perspective if you want to worry about the competition. But yeah, it's it's really amazing how far Vinny Jr. has come. Yeah, yeah it is. And I, I wonder where the next level of this evolution is going to be. Let's speak a bit about Betis. Um, Fekir came off injured, but I would say what impressed me the most about Betis in this game, because I feel offensively, apart from the goal, they were, they were lacking in a lot of final balls. But defensively, I felt they were very good. I felt Luis Felipe came in and or Felipe came in and he was solid in that area. Guardado and Judo, they worked really well to make Real Madrid shoot from afar. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, defensively, Betis really made this a very close game scoreline-wise, and you have to give them credit for that. I feel the weak link defensively was Sabahi, and when Ribal came, he immediately like organized Vinicius, like, hey, I'm here now. So, yeah, yeah, I'm really like, yeah, I'm like, I wonder why he didn't start Ribal when he's been starting him in the past three games. That was a bit strange, but yeah. I feel maybe because Ribal is naturally a right winger and he felt maybe against this Real Madrid side, it made sense to have a natural right back. Yeah. In that situation. yeah. I feel like this right back problem that Real Betis kind of have, if any, if there's a weakness in their team, it's definitely that area of the pitch. Yeah. And it's sad that, I guess, from Betis' perspective, that Bay Arena has gone to Barcelona at this, mm-hmm. this window. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, Robert says they're going to be fighting against Villarreal, I believe, all season for the top four. They're going to play Villarreal next next week, actually. And nice. Villarreal, they won comfortably against Elche, very comfortable. And it yeah. seems like with Villarreal, they, they're maturing into this team that can get the business done. Because last season, they weren't winning this comfortably. I believe they haven't conceded the goal all season in La Liga so far. No, they're the only team in Europe's top five leagues that have not considered the goal. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. There was another team that had not considered the goal, but we'll get to them later. <laughs> yeah, we will. Yeah. But yeah, Villarreal. So like yeah. I'm making... Yeah, the, yeah. Villarreal, I'm making my prediction for them to even finish as high as third so far look on the money. But it's a very long season. We'll have to see. Yeah, and... I want to touch on Jackson because he's done really well. They were one of the teams looking to buy Sadiq, but Sadiq went somewhere else. Mm-hmm. And because of that, Jackson has come into play and he's doing really well. Um, do you feel that this season he can take the next step or is he just holding the water for Dan Juma? Uh-huh. I feel even though, even when Dan Juma comes back, um, um, Jackson has done enough to make himself an option at the very least where Emery can be like, I can play you sometimes, I can play Danjuma and given that Villarreal are in Europe to Jackson is definitely going to play a lot even if it's conference league, like any experience will be vital for him to gradually take that next step That is true and when you have someone like Jose Luis Morales who can come off the bench for him and mm-hmm. Score a goal like that in his former stadium. Yeah. <laughs> it was beautiful. Yeah, home away from first home. I thought he missed it. Yeah, at first I thought he miskicked it, but like when you look at the replay and you're like, damn, this guy actually meant it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah but on, yeah. Hold on. On, on Elk Chay, though, like th- this is the centenary year and they started the season so poorly. Do you think Francisco yeah. can last? I mean, his post-match comments about things not being right aren't looking pretty good, to be honest. But I yeah. think, but, but, I think, yeah. I think Elche, like Atafi, have just had it, the short end of the stick in terms of opponents because Elche have had to play three of last season's top seven already. Yeah. And they have Athletic Bilbao next, then Barcelona. Oh. So it doesn't look... It doesn't agree for them. And you know what? With Francisco's comments, I sort of agree with him because you are Mojica, who was Elche's star left back, one of the Elche's exactly. best players, left on the final day of the market to Villarreal. Mm. And if I'm a coach, that, that really upsets me. And yeah. it brings up the larger question, right? 
a lot of La Liga managers have spoken about this, about whether we should end the transfer window before the season starts. We know England tried that experiment, but it worked against them. Do you think it makes sense if that comes to Spanish football? I'm also I'm of the opinion that we, we shouldn't do that and just leave things as they are. Yes, it's it's pretty upsetting to lose someone like Morica like that. And even though they brought the replacement in, we don't know how good that replacement will be. But yeah. overall, if, even if let's say we we end this the transfer window before the season starts, we still have the bloody emergency sign new rule. Real, so yeah. if someone wants to coach <laughs> Morika, if they if they yeah. say their their strike against injury and we are like, oh, we'll replace him with a left back, it's not you can yeah. do so. <laughs> yeah, it is. Like, like you know what, with that rule, I can see why it's put in place, but I just feel that there's too there are too many loopholes. Like if that rule was just like, oh, you can sign someone on loan to replace uh, an injured player who like let's say someone gets injured for like eight months and you're like, oh, I can't really replace this guy right now. So I can see why that rule is there, but it's just buying a striker to replace a left back. <laughs> like what's also doing Nolito? I don't think it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, for Elche, it seems like it's going to be a tough old season. It's looking a tough old season for Atletico though. Uh, in this game, the Atletico club manager uh, or team manager, not Diego Simeone, the guy who is in charge of like the bus and then everything. Mm-hmm. He came out and he was like, this is a disgrace. Um, he called the refereeing performance like shocking to use a more clean sanitized word. Do you agree with that? And if that's a story, we also see that. Again, remember how the referee blew the whistle early in their last game against Valencia? The same thing yeah. happened again, so I'm like, I, I don't get what's going on there. Like, why are the referees just making themselves a talking point? Yeah, because but, you, you allow the play to go on, at mm-hmm. least. And yeah. if you don't, if it doesn't go on, and if they take the advantage, then fine. Yeah. But it is, I can see where some people are like, this one is slightly better than the other one, because at least, because... Well, <laughs> It actually, I'm just remembering the whole thing now, and it's just as bad because why? Yeah, because yeah, the ball goes to Koke. Koke passes it to Anel Korea, yeah. who puts the ball back in the net. Did and he think Korea was, was offside? I don't know, but it, even if he was offside, right, you at least bring the play back because there, there isn't that many passes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the Atleti also complained about the treatment of both goals. The one scored like scored by John Felix versus Sadiq, who made his debut and he scored the equalizer. Mm-hmm. And John Felix's goal was called up for a handball. Similar, and they were claiming that Sadiq's goal should have been called up because like it does touch a part of his arm. I'm no arm expert, but like I I, I don't know. I don't know what to say in this situation. Do you have any opinions? I. Uh- I believe the Joe Felix one is that he touched his hand, so it shouldn't be allowed. The Sadiq yeah. one, I haven't seen it enough times to see with, whether it touched his hand or not. But if it did touch his hand, then it should be ruled out. And if that's the case, then I don't know. But I haven't seen it as many times as other people yeah. have, so I don't really know. Yeah. But, but let's talk about football. Let's shy away from controversy because this was actually a pretty good game besides controversy. Atleti, yeah. I felt they did really well. We also said they did really well. It was, I felt a draw was a fair result. Yeah, it, it was the fair, the fair results. In the first half, Atleti were slightly better and the second half, we also said they were mostly better and both teams had good performances, especially Momocho and um, Marata and Carrasco. And Gorosaba was also really good for us. So said that, oh yeah, that's it. Footballing wise, the two teams were pretty even. Yeah, and Sadiq, he made such a difference when he came on because he gave something that Sorloff couldn't give. And I know we've compared Sadiq a bit to NSU, but I saw something in this game that makes me feel he might have something that NSU doesn't have in that raw strength. And that ability to like just like True. get into the right places, 
because even though he was like slipping and falling and like <laughs> tripping on himself and being clumsy, he still found a way to get further of the ball to keep possession of the ball. <laughs> yeah, there was a time where he, I think he wanted to do a crush turn. I'm like, you calm down, you're not that guy. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Sadiq, like you said, is much stronger than an S3 and yeah, he really had a very good effect on the game for us. If he can keep this continuity, then he'll definitely, the way he's going in terms of goals, both for Maria and Yusuf, that he's going to do better than Isaac, Charlotte, Porto, and Yanuzai all put together did last year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we shall see. But Atleti, though, they're struggling for goals. And do you think? It's bye bye La Liga for them, or is that is it too early? Because they have Salsa coming up, then after that, the Madrid Derby. Uh, it's it's too early to say bye bye any team for anyone's ambitions, except if you're really if you're like zero points from six games or something. But mm. yeah, for Atleti, I don't. I feel they they are yet to give a fully convincing performance this season. They should start from there. I, this was a good step. This game was their best game this season to me. So this is a good step in the right direction. Yeah. Next up, they have Salta, who looked amazing on Friday night. They they played, like, first half, I'll say, they were quite disappointing. But in the second mm-hmm. half, they played some beautiful stuff, didn't they? Yeah. The second half was just ma- magic from Aspas, man. Like... Guy scored two great goals from the from outside of the box. You know, um, their second goal was a team of absolute beauty. Like every football lover would yeah. love that goal. Like the way everyone was just linking up and then Oscar finishes it. Uh, it's, it was yeah. a very it was a very good performance for Celta. And even though they lost, they got hammered by Roma did scoreline wise like two weeks ago. That wasn't a bad game for them. And like Valencia, they've not really had a bad game this season. And this is just like improving. It is just a great improvement to their start. Yeah, like, like you said, it's I'll say the same thing. They've been a joy to watch throughout the season. And I, I'm hoping to see what they do against Atleti. But Cadiz, they've been, they've, you say Celso haven't had any bad games, but Cadiz, they've, all, they've had four bad games. Bad routines, quite likely. <laughs> I don't know. Like they they tried he tried Sergio tried to mix it up with a new formation, added a bunch of new signings in, but still nothing. It's like had this two seasons ago and last season. When you imagine them, imagine passion. They are not playing with yeah. any sort of passion. So I don't know. Things could get really ugly for them. But yeah, you know their next yeah, opponent, <laughs> they have a good history against them. So, <laughs> okay, okay. Well, well, I, I don't know, man. I, I feel, I feel that. You, too, okay, man. you know, you know, I've been doing this false modesty thing. Okay, I'll be serious. <laughs> I'll tell you exactly what will happen. Cardis will get their first goal next week. Like I'm yeah. going, I'll, I'll say they are going to win or draw, but they will at least score one. How many they concede, however, is depending on <laughs> how how much we rotate because we're going to play Bayern immediately after them. So yeah. if he decides to maybe rest Lewandowski, then maybe they get off lightly. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like I'll say, normally I'm like no terrorism of football, but this is the game. If you're going to play terrorism of football, this is yeah. the play. This is yeah, the yeah, like I feel... They will do everything in their power to frustrate Barcelona like they usually don't, but hopefully we can get the job done this time. Because if we do not beat Cadiz as they are, then we're never going to beat them. <laughs> yeah, never, ever, never, ever. And, but let's move and, on to more yeah, positive. I was yeah. going to say one more thing. I don't know if the Cadiz board are going to treat this game as a game that Cadiz should actually win because I feel sucking. Sergio, because he lost, maybe he loses back to Barcelona, isn't exactly the reason why you should sack him. You should no, sack him no. for the games before. Those are more yeah. sackable offenses. 
or the game after Barcelona, which is by the lead, which should be a celebrity death match for La Liga managers. <laughs> yeah, because uh, Sergio returned to River the lead and River the lead are playing tomorrow and they, are, they haven't won yet, but at least they have a point. So they're scoring. Yeah. And, they're and scoring. they've scored. <laughs> yeah. Let's move on to more positive things with Osasuna, who at El Sadar, they are unbeatable at the moment. Three three games, three wins, two goals in each game. Yeah. I'm a rough scores yet again. You know, he's not just a penalty man. The guy actually has <laughs> the guy is really talented. I really like how he took his goal. You know, um Ryo. They scored a free kick with Lejeune, who came back from suspension. I think he came back for a suspension last week, but then oh sorry, he came back for a suspension this week. And they yeah. made it really close. But then a moment of magic from Abdi, who tees up Ruben Garcia, is what separates the two teams ultimately. Yeah, Abdi is such a great signing because when he was at Barcelona last season, before all the magic money entered Barcelona <laughs> and they signed. <laughs> Palanca. He was one of Barcelona, yeah, the Palancas. He was one of Barcelona's best players, wasn't he? Yeah, uh, him, Jude Go. The Barcelona emergency <laughs> squad will never be forgotten. <laughs> yeah, but no, back never. to the present. I always felt like while Abdi was very promising, he was really, really, really raw in terms of his end product and everything. And I felt like he needed a very good loan at a La Liga level club and it seems the Osasuna fans already love him. He's happy to be there. So he could be really important for them. And Osasuna, if they keep up this home form, they may be a dark horse for Europe this year. Who knows? Yeah, they maybe they they made some really good signings because they signed they brought in Ruben Pena mm -hmm. from Villarreal, Moy Goma. Yeah, and Ma Ma Gomez was really good to... today as well. Yeah. Like they're, they're gonna be it's I'm not sure how far they can go, but like if you're from El Sadar, especially when you see the atmosphere, mm -hmm. the way they gonna, play, yeah, no one is going to win there. I I'm going to say at most one team or two teams win there with any degree of comfort. Sure, I, I think it, it's going to be wrong because it is. I mean, no, Real Madrid they they'll, they'll struggle and win three one later. That's the formula. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's going will. to be Atleti uh, that really beats Osasuna because Joe Felix is oh, Osasuna. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they do really well there. That you're right, you're right, you're right, actually. You're right, actually. But let's talk about Mallorca because they are struggling to win at home, they were so so close, yeah, to winning at home. Yeah, this but game, then Girona still broke their hearts. Yeah, you know how we Terrorismo has mostly gone this game. It was kind of like a reminder that, that it, it's still its ugly head is very somewhere. Because <laughs> <laughs> like in short quality, short quality wise, the first half was horrible. The second half was a big improvement for Mallorca. But the only yeah. two good things that happened, the only good thing that happened apart from the goals was Riquelme's Rabona. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 that's in my saves now. But yeah, yeah. I warned you about him. I thought it was going to be good. Yeah, the thing is, I feel Mallorca was so close to winning, like you said, but then to concede a penalty like that and, you know, not win, it's just frustrating. Yeah, it is but frustrating. But regardless, Mallorca have only considered penalty goals this season. Like, they yet to concede from open play. They've been very solid. And the yeah. fact that Kangin has started his season well, I thought he was the shining light in the Dower game again. Yeah. But... If they can, I, I, Mallorca are definitely on the right track. Yeah. And it's, it's five points out of 12, right? Which is mm -hmm. awesome for a team like Mallorca, which everyone expects to go down. So, yeah, yeah it's definitely going, they're definitely going on the right track. Yeah. A team that maybe turned a corner was Espanyol, thanks to the new star, Martin Braithwaite. He scored <laughs> the first goal against Athletic this season. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, it was, it's quite... It was quite a really good goal and really near for Espanyol, who are short on numbers squad-wise because a bunch of people are injured, a bunch of people are out of favor, Roddy Thomas. Anyway. Yeah. 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 Let's talk about Roddy Thomas for, for a second. Yeah. Okay. Be before we do that, I had just said 
before Britain scored that, you know, Diego Martinez or someone should just let their pride down and allow Raul to match play on two <laughs> January. And then Britain goes and yeah. scores. I'm like, oh, maybe they don't need it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or should we, should we start with Braithwaite, right? Because let's start with Braithwaite. Espanol, Espanol, it's it's not something that usually happens recently, right? But like mm-hmm. there have been stars that have gone there. Mm-hmm. Do you think this is a good level of club for him to fully establish himself? Like he established yeah. himself as like an expert. He has him in the same sense. Yeah, of course, this is a good level for him. He's a really hardworking player. He always gives everything. He has quality. It's just that the quality level he has, if he, it's not required of, it's not like Lewandowski, obviously. But for Espanyol, I believe he can be really good for them. He's versatile enough to play on the flanks too if they decide to bring RDT back. So, yeah, it's pretty a pretty good move for him. And it ended up giving Diego Martinez his first win. Yeah, it did. And now with Raul Tomas, he was like, he was, you would have thought he would have gone to a big club like Sevilla, uh, uh-huh. maybe a top club in England. It was linked to Manchester United. It was linked to, I believe, Bayern Munich at some point. The fact that on yeah. deadline day, he's linked to Rayo. Rayo, that's the only club where that gave him a concrete offer. Like, what does that say about him, first of all? And the deal falls through, according to, radio in Spain, which believe it or not, could be, could be true or false. He was crying in a hotel because like it falls through at the last minute, it's like seconds. What does that say about Raul Tomas and how does he move forward from that? And how does Espanol integrate, reintegrate him back into the team? Because I feel he's an awesome player yeah. and he will really help Espanol. Well, I don't really know what it says about Raul Tomas per se, but it says a lot about Espanyol, the fact that they expected 70 million for him and they were, they were just, at the end of the day, they were trying to cancel his contract so he can go for free and something. I was like, that's, that's poor planning from them. And yeah, uh, kind of unrealistic to expect Sevilla to throw down 70 million for him when they got 54 per year. As for how they reintegrate him, I, I, they just have to do it. Like I don't think they need to think too much about it because he is their best, second best player at least when he's playing. And yeah. I, I, my predictions, I was like, if he were to stay, they can finish close. They can finish as high as seventh, eighth, ninth. Without him, it might be a struggle, but they'll definitely be mid table. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, we'll see. Now let's move on to Italy. The big game of the weekend was, without doubt, the Derby Malonina. I, I think I've butchered it. I'll just say the Milan Derby. Yeah, Milan. Uh, Derby. Milan won one three two against Inter Milan. Rafael Leao, he's really bossing it. Yeah. Yeah, he's he, he, last season he was really really good, and this season he's picked it up. You know, hopefully he can keep going for Milan's sake, and he can. Maybe win the Ballon d'Or instead of Benzema. I, I'm desperate at this point. <laughs> but yeah, it's, no, it's, no. it was a really good game for Uliao. Drew the game. You know, Mr. Clutch came up. And Inter, Inter made a good fight of it, scoreline-wise. But I feel like there was... I felt like even going into the game based on how they started the season, like Milan were clearly the favorite because Inter lose another big game again. Yeah, and the worry for Inter will be that they have Bayern Munich next. They've yeah. lost 3-1 against Lazio. They've lost in this game. Are they ready for Bayern? Well, if they get their house together, they might be, because it's not like Bayern are exactly flying at the moment. Yeah. But, yeah, they, they have to, Inter have to really sort their situation now because this, they they start the last two games have not been good at all. No, they haven't been good, but they haven't been good either for Juventus. They keep on drawing. I think they've had three draws so far this season in Serie A. This yeah. year against Fiorentina. Next is Paris Saint Germain. Scary times for Juventus, isn't it? Yeah, it's scary. For Paris Saint Germain, because <laughs> for Paris Saint Germain, why? 
because I, I, it's just a joke. It's all definitely scary for you because Mbappe, Messi, Neymar are actually not having so much drama. And if they play to their potential, Juve might get a real run lucky. <laughs> so I, I don't really know because Juve made a, quite a number of good signings this summer. It's just maybe they need more time to gel. You know, Chiesa, when Chiesa comes back, I feel like he will take them up another level. And losing the baller is obviously, and any team, most teams will struggle to lose a player of that quality. Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. That is true. Napoli, though, they've recruited really well in the summer transfer window. They reshaped their squad. They beat Lazio. Um, the Georgian guy who I refuse to pronounce his name for it. Um, KK. That's going to kick. KK. <laughs> See, that, that's, that's scary for a podcast, right? Because you just had one <laughs> extra KK. And we're off. <laughs> yeah, but, but that aside. <laughs> Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It is. A, yeah. I worried about Napoli because they lost. Like, ham, what am I saying? Hamshik, really? They lost in Sydney and, yeah. and then Mertens, Fabian Ruiz later on, Koibali. But the signings they've made have been pretty smart. You know, Raspadori came in, Simeone came in, and KK. Yeah, is really doing really well and. Yeah, right now they're top, and I hope Napoli can not Napoli this year and win the league. Like, because if you if I was to pick a team, I wanted to win the league. You know, to be Napoli, so they better do it. Yeah, in the immediate future, they have Liverpool, who they scored nine last week, but they've sort of flopped in the two games since then. Yeah. Isak really showed them a lot of problems. And <laughs> they couldn't score against, they couldn't beat Frank Lampard's Everton. Um, so, yeah. yeah. To be fair to Isak, he, he does like scoring against big teams. He scored against Barca, Atleti, Madrid, mm-hmm. now Liverpool. So, yeah. He lives for the big moments, Isak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, Napoli right now, the way they've been riding off a high of beating Lazio, they should be going to a Liverpool game with all sorts of confidence, especially given when, because when Liverpool have been bad this season, they've been bad. So they really need to, like, go there with every belief that they can at least draw. Don't just don't lose, because you want to make sure you get out of this group, because Ajax are also there, you know, so... Yeah, I definitely feel like Napoli are the favorites. And then let's let's stay in England for a moment because the United Arsenal was a big game. United they started the season pretty poorly, but now it looks like it's all going well for at United. They're winning yeah. in Devon. Yeah, and someone who's had a really big turn around is Marcus Rashford because he hadn't scored since January and he has he scored against Liverpool. He scored twice and assisted against Arsenal today. And yeah, just like my United, it's really like going good for him. Yeah, and Ross is that they should be really worried about United now. Uh, yeah, they, they, there's more to worry about than two weeks ago, but it's we'll see. I, I think my United, given the confidence they have and the fact that they've added Anthony in between Anthony. A goalkeeper in the Bravka that can catch crosses. Yeah, it should be. No, no shit that that yeah. here, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, yeah, my United are the favorites for this match, but we'll see. Hopefully, Real Sociedad can put up a challenge. Yeah, hopefully, it's not another 4 0. Yeah, where they uh, just get schooled. Yeah, we, uh, with City, they have, they have Sevilla up next. They tied against Aston Villa. Holland Ashley Young Masterclass. <laughs> <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Man, Man City drew against the Spirited Via side. And <laughs> Sevilla, the Sanchez Pijuan can be a very tough place to be. And it's up to Sevilla to make to determine how tough they want to make it. Granted, the center back situation is pretty bleak. So who knows what will happen? 
I just feel like Sevilla, they need to approach the game the same way they did against Barcelona, like with energy, with intensity, because if they just play flaccidly, it's going to be monumentally bad. But yeah, I, I feel I'm worried a lot about them, but I'm also really worried for Bayer Leverkusen. They haven't started the season well oh. at all. I believe they've only had one win so far in the Bundesliga. Mm -hmm. They're very close to the relegation zone. Luckily, they're playing, I believe they're playing against Brugge in the first game. But Is that lucky? They're playing against Jutkla. <laughs> you call it amazing. <laughs> but compared to Athletic or... Yeah, compared to Atleti, uh, Porto, it's the easiest of the draw. But, you know, Club Brugge are a team that have shown to give the big boys in Europe trouble over the last two years because they've drawn with PSG and given them issues. They've also drawn with Real Madrid once. So, uh, by the way, because if they manage to win this game, it will be a huge confidence booster because they really need that right now. Yeah. And... They lost to Freiburg, who are at the moment top of the Bundesliga. Freiburg, remember, they were sensation last season. I believe yeah. they got to the VFP Pokal. Final. So it's good to see them still. Yeah, final. So it's good to see them still like doing really well. Dortmund, they also won by the minimum. They have Copenhagen in City, Sevilla, group. That yeah. should be a layup for Dortmund, shouldn't it? Well, Dortmund, it's kind of a different Dortmund this season because besides that crazy game where they bottled it late, they've been winning 1-0, showing a lot of surprising defensive solidity. So, yeah, I believe they're favorites against Copenhagen and they should take advantage of it just in case either Sevilla surprise City or City just hammer Sevilla and then they're like, okay, let's establish ourselves at that least the second best team in the group. Yeah, that's about the last really high-profile game in the Champions League. That would be Spurs, Marseille. Um, Marseille, they've gotten off to a good start in Liga. Like, mm -hmm. Actually, three teams have gotten off to a very good start. PSG, obviously, Marseille. I'll say actually four. Lyon, too. They've gotten off to a good start. They haven't lost. Lens haven't lost. So will Marseille be as easy for Spurs as people think? Not at all. Not at all. Like I feel that group, right, with Spurs, giving yeah. Spurs' personal history, Antonio Conte's personal history, and the fact that people in England are just looking at those teams as free food, yeah. they could be in for a real shock, to be honest. But in yeah. games like these, in games yeah. like these, having a Harry Kane quality player definitely helps you. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, it's, it's really interesting to see how it we have Alexis, right? Yeah, we have a Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> we have Alexis. Yeah, we have him. Um... What's this yeah. guy's name? He, he just played for Granada last week. Luis Suarez. We have oh, Suarez. Luis Suarez. Yeah, the Suarez. Yeah, we have Suarez. <laughs> we have Pai. Yeah, it should be. I really. I feel like even if Marseille lose, they'll be. It will be close enough to where Spurs can say we've had a tough game on our hands. Yeah, and the, the other team in this group is Eintracht Frankfurt, who won comfortably this week. And so, Columbo. and it was, it was like, a, yeah, it wasn't against like any random team in the Bundesliga. This is RB Leipzig, which is one of the Champions League teams. So, yeah. 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 Columbo is starting really well for yeah. Frankfurt, and he's one another person to watch out for. for. Yeah, it would be nice to see Frankfurt like take over the Champions League the way they did the Europa League. Now that'll be something to see. Yeah. And with that, that's all we have for you all this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Please remember to like, subscribe, give us comments in case you have anything to say, you have any comments about our analysis of the games. But thank you so much for listening and adios. Thank you so much. Bye.